Good to be together today. God bless you. Well, this morning we're going to continue along the line talking about, we've been in a series about the heavenly vision. And uh, I want you to get your Bibles to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 7. 1 Chronicles 13 and verse 7. How many of you know we need wisdom in warfare? And we are in a spiritual battle, whether we like it or not. And I discovered a long time ago, there's no opting out. You are hated by the devil. And, and wear it as a badge of honor, praise the Lord. But the more that God has called you to do, the greater the opposition will be. And I want you to know there's hope and there's help. And there is a place of victory in warfare. You are not the victim. You are the victor. And I just appreciate that overwhelming response right there for... Y'all about blew me backwards right there. <laughs> you are not the victim. You are the victor. Now, thanks be unto God. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> I got them Kara students coming at me right now. Glory to God. You are the victor. You may not feel like the victor, but you need to understand this. You are not fighting for victory. You're warring from a position of victory. Thanks be unto God that who always causes us to triumph in Christ. But what happens is now our minds can fall off into a victim mindset. And what happens is feelings talk to us really loud. But here's what you and I have to understand. Just because you feel defeated doesn't mean you're defeated. Just because it looks like you're defeated does not mean you are defeated. You have to go to your Bible to find out who you are because the scripture talks about, James says it this way, the Bible is a mirror. It's like a mirror. And until you go to the mirror and look into that mirror, what mirror? The word of God, you don't know who you are. And so in flying, they call it instrument flying rules. If any of you ever know, there's, so when you become a private pilot, your first rating will be a VFR, visual flight rules. That means you can look outside the airplane, you can see the horizon, you can see all the different things. But there's this thing called weather. And when you get into the clouds or get into the soup, they call it, you become totally disoriented and you get a thing called vertigo and your feelings completely lie to you. And until you've experienced that, it's unlike anything you have ever done. And I'll guarantee if there's any pilots here, every pilot's got a story. Every one of them's got a story. So when even you're training as a visual flight rule pilot, VFR pilot, they will put you under the hood they will make you rely on those instruments. So when that instrument says you're straight and level, you trust the instrument, not what your feelings tell you. When you're looking and it says you're climbing and you think you're descending, you trust the, you have to trust the instruments and it takes a lot of training. Now they say if a VFR pilot gets into the weather it gives, they give them about four minutes before they crash when they get disoriented because your feelings just get all thrown out of whack. And that is a good analogy of what it's like as a believer because, you know, the scripture has these statements where it says, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. Greek word means perceptions. You know, the enemy will try to project perceptions on you, feelings that you're defeated, you're done, there's no use, give up. Anybody ever been there before? We all have, of course we have. And there are times where I honestly thought, yeah, I'm done, it's over, I see no way out. But the scripture tells us we're not to look at things that are seen, but things that are not seen. 
Because things that are seen are temporal, subject to change. They can change. And we are to look at things unseen. Well, how in the world do you look at something unseen? Because you have two sets of eyes. And this is a scriptural thing I'm telling you. When Elisha's servant came in, he was freaking out. Master, we're surrounded. We're in trouble. We're done. And what did Elisha pray? He prayed, Lord, open his eyes. Well, wait a minute, time out. His eyes were open because he just saw they were surrounded, but that was his first set of eyes. You have natural eyes and you have spiritual eyes. And so he prayed this prayer, Lord, open his eyes. And here's what scripture says. And the Lord opened his eyes and behold, the, the mountains were full of chariots of fire. I am here to tell you today, Mm, I could, I think I just preached myself happy right there. There are more with us than with the enemy. That if you could see what God has made available to us, your whole paradigm would change. Because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And often the Lord has to get us to the place where the odds are completely against us. Do you remember when he told Midian, he goes, Midian, I'm sorry, Gideon, it's Midianites, Midian. Okay, so he said, Gideon, I'm going to give the Midianites into your hands, but there's too many of you. And you know the story, right? What was the story? They were already outnumbered. They were completely outnumbered. He said, I can't give the Midianites into their hand. There's too many of you. So he said, let everybody go home. So Gideon said, everybody wants to go. So a whole bunch left. Then there was a group thought they were ready for battle. And he said, no, take them down to the water and do the water test. And if they drink this way and they're up looking around, they're ready. If not, and that reduced it to 300 people. After he got it down to 300 people, he said, now we're ready to go to battle. Can you imagine what your mind would be doing? And then the weapon of choice was clay pots and torches. God does, and why did he do it? Because he says, I don't want Israel to think they got themselves this victory. So if you find yourself in a place today where you have been reduced to nothing, call it the zero factor. That is a good place to be. You're in possibly the best place you could ever be. Have you ever noticed the further down we get, the more reduced in strength we get, the more inclined we are to call out unto the Lord? When we're feeling good and strong, you ever notice how we just don't have time for God? But when we hit the rock bottom, when we have nowhere else to go, when we, when we go way down low, then even nature preaches a sermon to us. Out in a desert, in dry seasons, good things happen during drought. What happens? The roots go deeper and deeper and deeper for moisture. Did you know in storms, the roots of trees are strengthened So when those storms blow and all of that instability comes, those roots have to go deeper and deeper. I had heard a story that uh, hotels like the Embassy Suites, you know, that are all covered in and they're so beautifully manicured inside and they got all these trees. Well, they're protected from all the storms of life. And they said one day, one of these big trees just fell over inside And they attributed it to the fact there was never any storm, never any adversity, never any winds. Some of you don't know it, but you wouldn't be half the person you are if you hadn't been through what you've been through. Everything the devil meant for evil in your life has worked for your good and it strengthened you and it put convictions in you. It's caused you to hate certain things, which that's a good thing. There are things the Lord hates. The Lord told the two churches in the book of Revelation, he said, one thing you have, and I like this, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And I studied that. It is accurate to say that would be that, our modern day equivalent of political correctness, the gospel of compromise. Some of you don't realize the things that you've seen, God has used it to birth in you 
something that he wants to bring forth on the inside of you. So let, let's get into the word today. First Chronicles 13, verse 7. And I want to talk to you about divine interruptions. Divine interruptions. All of us have had interruptions in our life. Now here's the two types of interruptions you're going to inter, intersect with in life. Some are demonic interruptions. We'll see how the Apostle Paul himself had an interruption by Satan. He had wanted to come time and again, but he was continually hindered by the devil. But then there's times there's been divine interruptions from the Lord. I've found that there have been times God's interruption has saved my life. There are times that the divine interruption has spared me a great deal of grief. And so that's why the Bible says, rejoice in all things, not necessarily for all things. So you, you leave and you have a car wreck, you don't rejoice for the car wreck. At least I don't. But I will tell you a story of a little Indian missionary many, many years ago that we knew and he told the story, so when I would go to visit him, we would drive to a place called Cochin, and then we'd catch a train, and then go to Bombay or Delhi, either one of those, and fly out of that. So you'd have to get up at two in the morning, and two in the morning, everybody's in bed and all of that, and here he is in his Jeep. And they're driving along, and his driver wasn't paying attention, and the roads aren't the best, and they hit this massive ditch and broke the axle just broke it on the Jeep. Well, everybody's in bed, so that completely interrupted their ability to catch that train the next day to go into the big city to take flight. Well, they were delayed a day, and then they found out most of India moves by train. But there are always, it seems, these are very old trains. Most of them are back from 40s and 50s, back with... Uh, you know, the British and all of that. The train that he was scheduled to be on was going along and a sacred cow got on there and the way that the, what you might call it, the driver of the train interacted caused that train to derail and it killed a lot of people on board. So whereas he was upset and mad about the broken axle, as he told me later, praise the Lord for the broken axle. Praise the Lord for the broken axle. <laughs> so there are times you may not realize it, but a delay is not necessarily a denial. It could be God's grace. It could be his mercy. What we have to understand is we can rejoice in all things. Somebody said, well, you just don't know entirely what I'm going through right now. Think about Paul and Silas, they were beaten and they were bloodied and they were bruised. And it says at midnight, they sang praises unto God. They prayed. The disciples went away rejoicing, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name's sake. I just feel like the Lord just quickening this to us right now, that the joy of the Lord is your strength, church and guard that. Don't let the enemy steal your joy. We can have joy in the midst of adversity. If the joy of the Lord is your strength, it stands to reason that enemy is going to try to set you up to get your joy to steal it, but he can't have it unless you give it to him, unless you yield to him. So I want to talk about divine interruptions. Is it a Holy Spirit restraint or is it the devil's hindrance? So let's look at a Old Testament type here, 1 Chronicles 13, verse 7. And it says here, they carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah in Ohio drove the cart. Then David and all Israel played music before God with all their might, with singing on harps, stringed instruments, tambourines, cymbals, and with trumpets. And when they came to Chidon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and he struck him because he put his hand to the ark, and he died there 
before God. Verse 11, David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. Therefore, that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day saying, how can I bring the ark of God to me? So David would not move with the ark, move the ark with him into the city of David, but took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months, and the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. Now one thing, this is so loaded with meaning in this particular thing. So the Ark of the Covenant was key to Israel winning their victories. And in the New Testament, there is no longer an Ark of the Covenant we're trying to locate like, uh, what's his name? Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones. <laughs> he's, on the, he's on the look for it. And there's a question, where is it right now? I'll tell you where it is. You are the Ark of the Lord. That was a type and shadow. So what is the Ark of the Covenant? It's a little box. It was a wood box overlaid with gold inside and out. But it was the ingredients to the Ark that made this thing so powerful. As long as Israel had the Ark of the Covenant, they won their battles. But when they allowed the enemy to capture the Ark, they began to lose their battles. So what was in it? Number one, the tablets of stone. Speaks of the written word of God, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are so powerful because they came directly from God. He wrote them out. Have you ever wondered why there's such a fuss to get the Ten Commandments out of courtrooms and schools? It's actually a very sad sign for America because our whole criminal justice system, our whole nation is established upon the law of God. And we've let it be taken. So the first thing that the tablets of stone represent in the Ark of the Covenant is you and I's love for the Word of God. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needs not be ashamed. Rightly dividing, meaning cut a straight line through the truth of God's Word. I'd like to know, if we took a survey of America, how many studied the Word of God this week? I mean, really studied the word. A lot of people have Bibles, but they just sit on coffee tables and collect dust. When you find out the founders of this nation in colonial America, prior to the birth of this nation, families, Puritans, and things like, they'd spend three, four, five, six hours a day studying the scriptures. How do we restore the Ark of the Covenant? We restore that love for God's word once again to us. The second thing was in it was the golden pot of manna. What does that represent? Well, when God sent Israel through the wilderness, he said, I will provide for you. I will have manna daily. You wake up in the morning and you won't eat heavenly manna. God, and he says, but you can't store it up, Israel. And when they tried to store it up overnight, it got wormy. The only time he allowed that was on the Sabbath. You could get a double portion and it wouldn't go bad. And why did the Lord do that? Because he didn't want them to build barns and everything like that. They were just passing through the wilderness. God wanted to take them into a promised land. And what that speaks to us is when we study the word, then it must become the living word. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In other words, the same way that we rely on natural food should be the word of God. And when I first gave my life to the Lord, I was scripturally illiterate. All I knew, there's was full of a lot of do's and don'ts. And if you're having fun, it sure enough can't be God. And he was always out to get you. And then I learned later on, God wasn't out to get me because if he hadn't protected me, I'd have got myself and the devil would have taken me out. It was God's mercy and grace till I could come to that place where I began to hunger and thirst after righteousness, where I began to taste and see that the Lord is good. And then all of a sudden I'd study his written word. And even though sometimes it confused me, all of a sudden it would come alive and it was a rhema word, it was a living word and, and it would cause light to come into me. So you have the written word, and the study of that written word leads to the 
living word, but then that third piece, and it was Aaron's rod that budded. What was that? It was an old dry almond stick, an old dry almond stick that bore fruit instantly. That speaks of the anointing of God, the ability of a believer to bear fruit instantly. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, it shall be done, and you will bear much fruit. And that church is what is missing in the world today. We have the majority in America, we have the greatest religious liberty and freedom, and yet we are beginning to see things happen in America we never thought could happen. Why, because God's not listening to us, no, because we've allowed the ark of his covenant, and it's also called the ark of his presence. We've allowed that to be captured. The ark of the covenant used to be locked away in the holy of holies. Under the Old Testament, only the high priest could go in once a year. And it says in the Old Testament that the Lord said, I will manifest myself above the Ark of the Covenant. And there was this thing called the mercy seat that had to be above the Ark. And they would sprinkle the blood on it because if God looked down and saw his word, it would be instant death. But thank God for the mercy seat. How many of you know who our mercy seat is now? Jesus is our mercy seat. His blood cries, forgive them, Father. I have taken this penalty. I've paid the penalty. So what was the deal with Israel? When the Ark of the Covenant was captured, they were still God's people, but they would go into battle and lose. Have you ever wondered sometimes, you fight, you war, you press in, you do all those different things, and it seems like the enemy still just gets away with things. We've seen it in this nation right now. It's the Ark of His presence, the Ark of the Covenant, and so because of this, we go back to this whole story. There is so much on here. Notice this in 1 Chronicles 13, 7. So they carried the ark of God on a new cart. Whoa, are we trying to carry the presence of God in our newfangled ways? Are we trying to do church a new way? Lord, we got it all figured out and we just need you to fit in our box called church. And so what ends up happening, they got this new cart, put the Ark of the Covenant, they were going along and the oxen stumbled and Uzzah reached out to do a good thing to steady the Ark and the anger of the Lord hit him and it smote him. Well, when you get over in the New Testament, we see other areas because how many of you know that our God is an awesome God? He is a consuming fire. The Bible says, behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God. Some people present the Lord and the Lord Jesus like he's your, our heavenly butler and a good old boy and a, our buddy would just slap on the back and hey, if I need you, Lord, I'll just call you. Till then, don't cramp my style. And our God is an awesome God. He's a consuming fire. And so Ananias and Sapphira, now the Ark of the Covenant, you can look in the book of Acts, you'll see the, the manifestation of it because Peter walking along and his shadow falls on someone and heals them. They prayed over handkerchiefs. They went back and demons came out of people and people were healed. They prayed and buildings shook. That's that modern day Ark of his presence, the Ark of the Covenant. So Ananias and Sapphira paid a heavy price because they were careless. They were selling, having everything coming, and all of a sudden they did, and they said, hey, look, honey, I know everybody's giving everything. Why don't we just give a little portion, and you know, they'll just think we brought all of it. And Peter didn't know this in his natural mind. The word of knowledge came. Ananias, when you had the land that you sold, was it not yours to do with what you wanted? Well, yeah. Well, then why did you allow the... Satan, to fill your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost, and the Bible says he fell down dead. Sapphira came in not too long afterwards, the very same thing. Does that tell us our God is an awesome God? He and his presence, when it comes, causes evil to be consumed. 
And we have to understand that we have tried to steady the ark possibly in this new day, the way that we've done church, the way that we do church. And God is saying to us, I'm an awesome God. And he's worthy of our highest praise and our lives to be laid down as a living sacrifice for him. We kind of, you know, fit God in as our schedule allows instead of building our lives around him. We would be nothing without him. This country would not be here without him. We owe everything as Americans to God. We're not better than others, but we sure do owe him a lot, everything. If it were not for the Lord, this nation would not exist. And many of you that have gone overseas, you know what it's like to live in some of these countries. The next 24 hour, many, many people will die because they are Christians. They will be persecuted, put to death because they're a Christian. That's their crime. So they carried the ark of God on a new cart. And then it says, David and all Israel played music before God with all their might, singing, harps, stringed instruments, and this interruption came. Now look at verse nine, when they came to Chidon's threshing floor. What is the threshing floor? The threshing floor in the scripture can be a time of judgment. I don't believe that's where we're at. I believe it's a time of separation, sifting and refining. But the threshing floor is a violent place. We have had a divine interruption in this nation. I don't know about you, but you know, if we go back before March 15th and before all this stuff happened, do you remember, I look back and I go, you know, things were pretty simple. And you remember the times restaurants shut down and you couldn't go anywhere and you forget your mask and everybody looks at you like you have the plague and <laughs> run you out of the store. And then we saw news things where people freaked out and attacked people and fear began to just permeate and all of a sudden businesses, people going out of business, there's been this upheaval, there's been this shaking. And I don't know about you, but for me personally, it's caused sifting to go on in my life. All of a sudden I'm going, there's a lot of stuff we were focused on, it's not that important. There's been refining, and all of a sudden, all I can think about is what did we do with our times of liberty? Did we use and steward them wisely? Sifting, refining, and separation. It's a lot of separation going on. Yes, sheep from the goats, but even sheep from the sheep. It surprised me how many people have gotten so offended during this time. The Lord said, blessed are those who are not offended. But the threshing floor is a place where the Lord gets rid of the useless. John the Baptist used the imagery of the threshing floor to describe the coming Messiah who would separate true from false believers. Now, a lot of times people think this, that if you preach Jesus and somebody gets offended at you, that you've missed it. But when I read the word, Jesus actually said, I didn't come to bring peace, but I came to bring division. I came to set people against one another. But this scripture right here, Luke chapter two, verse 33, it says, Joseph and his mother marveled at the things that were spoken to him. So this is Simeon. Simeon was given a promise. He would see the Messiah before he died. So here's the baby, the Christ child. Verse 34, it says, Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Verse 35, yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Wow, that's the word of the Lord over Jesus. So when God begins to move, when God sends forth powerful things, it doesn't always get everybody excited. It causes a divine interruption in the way things are going. Remember this, God's more interested in our character than in our comfort. Sometimes there has to be an interruption. I believe that this 
the storms we're going through in America, there, remember we talked about the three storms. There's Jonah's storm, storm that comes out of rebellion. And then there's the disciple storm, the storm that comes out of perfect obedience. And then there's Paul's storm that comes out of others' disobedience. I think America's experiencing all three of those storms right now. I believe we are experiencing storm because we've rebelled against God as a nation. You may not have, but a lot of people have. We've put leaders in office that hate God. They're God haters. So we've got a storm coming because of the rebellion of those that we've put over us to lead us. We did like Israel. We want a king. We want these types of leaders. Then there's the perfect obedience that causes a storm. And some of you, there's a remnant still in America and they're standing for what's right. And it's causing a storm. People are saying, if you'll just quit the God stuff, if you'll just back off, if you'll just back down and let us just come in and teach your children what we want to teach them and take over this government and take away your voice and all that. And we're saying, no, there will not be. We have a war. We have a fight on our hands. You, we're enemies now. And then there's Paul's storm. We're experiencing things right now as a nation because of other people's disobedience. And so you have to know each, what's required in each one. Well, Jonah's storm requires repentance. God does not bless rebellion. He never will. We have got to repent as a nation, stand in the gap for others. Then the disciple storm that's coming because of obedience, we have to have persevering faith. Exercise, I'm sorry, exercise spiritual authority. We sang it this morning, I have authority. We have to exercise that authority. Even though you sit there and you're speaking to the storm and you're commanding that thing and it feels like nothing's happening. Personally, there's some people that need to do that right now. I just sense that so strong. The enemy has come to steal and kill and destroy from some of you in here right now. And you're praying to the Lord, but the Lord is saying, no, I have given you the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, start speaking to the enemy, start commanding him to loose and let go of your family and your situation. Draw near to the Lord and the Lord will draw near to you. Nothing happens until we begin to speak. And we have to be careful that we don't say what is. You have to call things that be not as though they were. Some of the biggest breakthroughs I've ever seen in my own personal life, I was speaking against the adversary and there was a war going on right here in my mind saying, you are wasting your time. You think something's happening and it's not. And the battle was won or lost in the mind. For some of you, it's not because the enemy has so much strength. He is talking to your mind and you have to put on the helmet of salvation. You have to gird up the loins of your mind. You have to cast down imaginations. You have to put that enemy under your foot and you have to stand strong and don't relent, don't back up. See, some of you, you know, you've been called stubborn and hard-headed and bull-headed and all that. Amen, glory to God. That is a blessing. Use it for the kingdom. Use that bullheadedness for the kingdom. Use that sternness, that relentlessness for the kingdom of God. And then Paul's storm, persevering faith, do not give up. Someone I talked to after first service, a friend came up to them and said, our country's done right now. No, it's not. We are not done. God did not bring us this far to drop us off. I don't care what is going on out there, who is in office, it makes no difference. We have the hand of God on this nation. Certainly not because of us, it's in spite of us, God is not, due with this, is not done with this country. He is far from done. He's about ready to get started to do some things. Let's just give the Lord a praise for his goodness and his mercy today. So Lord, we thank you for the United States of America. And I thank you for everybody under the sound of my voice right now. I just feel like the enemy has uh, just got some people right on the edge right now. Just open your heart up 
And we as a body of Christ, family of God, stand with you right now. Lord, we stand in the gap for those that are under siege right now, those that have become weary in well-doing, those that are battling, Lord, forces of darkness against them personally, against their family. I bind spirits that come to steal, kill, destroy. We stand in the gap right now, Lord. I just bind up that spirit that say there's no use. Any kind of a spirit that makes you think you shouldn't be here or there's no use is a demonic force. That is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will never tell you to give up, ever. There is no defeat in Christ. There's only victory. He's already made a way where there is no way and those that are being severely tried and tempted right now, God has got a way of escape. And Lord, we pray right now that you will show that way of escape to everyone here in the mighty name of Jesus. Just open your heart up right now. Southwest, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you online. Just lift your hands up. Lifting your hands up is a sign an outer sign of an inward reality. Lord, I lift my hands to you. The Bible says, lift up the hands that hang down. Let the weak say, I am strong. If you're feeling weak, it's so counterintuitive, but you need to begin to say, I am strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You ought to just say it right. You don't have to say it loud. You can say it loud, but you need to begin to say, I am strong in the Lord and the power of His might. No weapon formed against you can prosper. And then you need to personalize that. No weapon formed against me can prosper. In the name of Jesus, every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you condemn it and show it to be in the wrong. In the mighty name of Jesus, I declare that over your people, Lord. We break every word curse that has ever been spoken against this people in the mighty name of Jesus. We uproot every curse in the mighty name of Jesus. Every vex, every spell in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just receive the cleansing of your presence, of your power, of the blood of Jesus. I break generational curses over people right now in the name of Jesus. Just worship Him, worship Him right now. Let's go ahead and stand up and bless the Lord. Oh, come, let us magnify the Lord. Let us exalt His name together. We thank you, Lord, for victory in this house today. Victory in every life in the mighty name of Jesus. I'm telling you, this is spiritual warfare right here. There is the power of life and death are in the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Speak life and not death. Woo, let's give the Lord praise this morning. Come on, Southwest. If anybody's not born again, I'm gonna lead us all in this prayer. You just receive the Lord into your life. You're ready, Jesus, to be Lord of your life. Say this out loud, Lord Jesus. Come on, let's say it like we mean it. Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Savior, and I make you Lord of my life. Thank you, I am saved, I am healed, I am delivered, I am victorious. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give him a shout, hallelujah. We thank you, Lord.